icons who called L.A.'s Laurel Canyon home. Jimi Hendrix. There's nobody like Jimi playing the guitar like that. The Doors. Jim Morrison was one of the people that was always part of our little clique. Once upon a time, there was this place called Laurel Canyon. And if you had been fortunate enough in the mid to late 60s to have lived there, you would have found yourself among the most magical of people. In 1965, half of the population of what we call the Western world was under the age of 25. You have a revolution and evolution in consciousness when you have a condition like that. You know, we were the new generation. We were the hippies, you know. We all felt like brothers and sisters, and there was love was in the air and peace and, and there lots of wonderful music happening. Laurel Canyon was the epitome of the summer of love. I mean, people, you know, me, uh, girls and boys hitchhiked up and down the road. We saw the possibility of the way we could live. There was no separation between races or gay, straight, whatever. You know, it was all love and the, the whole canyon was thick with it. All the hip people uh, moved there because it was right by the Sunset Strip but it was in the forest at the same time so you could have both a city, country and city, town and country effect. I think initially musicians kind of congregated here is because it was inexpensive to live. Uh, you had all of these people from like the Doors, the Birds, Buffalo Springfield. I lived across the street from Mark Volman of the Turtles, Jackson Brown right up the hill from Mickey Dolenz and, and uh, Joni Mitchell and Frank Zappa. It never, never occurred to me that, you know, 20, 30 years later, this would be, a, a, you know, a, a part of a history. My neighbors were Linda Ronstadt, John Mayle, Cass Elliott, the guys from Three Dog Night. The band Love, Crosby, Stills and Nash. You know, there were some girls too. Of course, I paid attention to the boys. You know, it just seemed normal to us at the time, but looking back, it was unbelievable. And from this open-minded forest, a quick thumb ride down the hill would put you right in the heart of LA's music universe. Sunset Strip was where you went to parade. But we were all trying to play the same clubs. At night, we were all trying to get gigs just so the band could eat, either at the Whiskey or Beto Lito's or uh, Pandora's Box. The Whiskey A Go Go was an amazing place then. You could see the best acts in the world at the time. We, we played the Whiskey A Go Go with some band called Led Zeppelin, and nobody had ever heard of either one of us. You know, we were just two local bands at the Whiskey A Go Go. It was during this time that another big change was about to take place fueled by four long-haired musicians from across the pond. The Beatles really, I can uh, they were the impetus for, for the change in music. When the Beatles played Ed Sullivan, first of all, all the folk groups saw that performance and saw that joyful music and said, you know, what are we singing about ox drivers for when we could be doing that joyful? And they wrote their own music and played electric instruments. So all the folk groups went out, electrified our instruments, and so did everybody. And you had the Buffalo Springfield then and the Birds and these new kind of electric folk rock groups. In 1964, the Laurel Canyon-based group, The Birds, were made up of David Crosby, Michael Clark, Gene Clark, Chris Hillman, and Roger McGuinn. And their new folk rock sound was the talk of the town. When we saw the birds play at Zero's, it just kind of really knocked us out seeing them. And, and they had what was called a Sherwood Forest crowd. These were the freaks, the hippies, uh, Vito and, and Carl Franzoni and, and those people. So they were there and then and they brought the crowds in, just came basically to gawk at them. The birds also had their share of young gawking groupies, including a teenage Pamela Miller, now Pamela DeBar, who would later become a member of the girl band, the GTOs. I found out they all lived in Laurel Canyon and of course got all their addresses and would hitchhike to their homes and just sit out in front of them. I was in love with Chris Hillman, the bass player, and I finally got the nerve to go knock on his door. In those days, you could just knock on people's doors, you know, and just be cute and pretty and they'd invite you in. That's what happened to me a lot in Laurel Canyon. 
It wasn't long before the rest of the country would become enamored with the birds as well. And in 1965, their take on a Bob Dylan song launched them into the worldwide spotlight. I mean, I remember when the birds finally had their big hit with uh, Mr. Tambourine Man. It was like, yeah, great. I mean, our good friends are finally, they're on the radio. I can't believe it, you know. And then so one by one, each person started getting played. Everybody started writing their own music, which was way different because Frank Sinatra never wrote any songs, Elvis Presley never wrote any songs, but these guys did, and it started with the Beatles and Bob Dylan. That was a huge sea change in the music business, you know. Um, they used to have singers and songwriters, and now you had singer-songwriters. Where are you walking? I've seen you walking. Have you been there before? We lived on Lookout Mountain. We also lived on Kirkwood, maybe half a mile up. These two identical houses, and we had both houses, and we lived there for quite some time. I think we played something like $100 a month or something for each house, which is incredible. The whole area was inspiring, I think, because there there was this kind of a friendly rivalry where everybody wanted to do the very best that they could. Not for the money, it was just about the music, you know, and just about creating something and pushing the envelope. Founded by Arthur Lee and Johnny Eccles, along with band members Brian McLean, Ken Forsey, Albon Snoopy Fisterer, and Michael Stewart Ware, the band Love was groundbreaking in many ways, including being one of the first racially mixed bands. <laughs> Though hugely popular on the West Coast, Love never achieved the worldwide success many believe they deserved. We were having problems with our record company. We'd been offered a really fantastic deal to leave and go with MCA, which was a much larger record company than Electra was at the time. And they just were, were not going to let us go. And so we came up with the dumbest idea we could. We thought if we hooked them up with the doors, they'll let us go. So we hooked them up with the doors, and instead of letting us go, they kind of used the money that they would have used to promote us for the doors. So basically, we shot ourselves in the foot. Love's groundbreaking album, Forever Changes, is listed in Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums of All Time, coming in at an impressive number 40, ahead of Meet the Beatles and Bob Marley Legend. Named after the Buffalo Springfield Steamroller Company, the Laurel Canyon folk rock band consisting of Dewey Martin, Richie Perret, Bruce Palmer, Neil Young, and Stephen Stills would gain worldwide attention with a song about protests and unrest on the Sunset Strip. It was just honestly an avalanche of kids from all over the world that came to Sunset Strip. And they basically would close the street down on the weekends. You couldn't drive on Sunset Strip. It was just like a, a love-in down there. From Crescent Heights to Doheny was just full of people walking to the merchants. I think they, uh, they looked like Halloween. Everybody was dressed up with hippie clothes, hanging in coffee shops with very little money, you know, hogging tables. And they complained to the city council, and the cops started parking a big bus asking everybody for ID and arresting all kinds of underage kids. It was not unusual to go down to Sunset Boulevard and see 500 kids with their arms against the wall being frisked. Basically, it was open season on hippies. For anyone under the age of 18 years old remaining in the area will be arrested. The mounting tensions of a 10 p.m. curfew combined with police harassment and the closing of the popular nightclub Pandora's Box culminated in a November 12, 1966 protest that turned violent. Something happening here but What it is ain't exactly clear There's That was the anthem because it really did speak to what was going on on the street. You know, um, and it really was uh, the hippies against the police. Which was ridiculous, really. Why not just let everybody... Mm -hmm. It was very peaceful, you know. Why not let people have a good time and mm -hmm. be happy? In August of 67, the Los Angeles City Council claimed the streets at the intersection of Sunset and Crescent Heights needed to be realigned, and Pandora's box was demolished. The headlines in the LA Times read, Hippies pout, politicians cheer. Buffalo Springfield would disband about a year later. Just behind the Canyon Country Store on Rothdale Trail is one of Laurel Canyon's most famous pads, known as the Jim Morrison Love Street House. 
While living here with longtime girlfriend Pamela Corson, Morrison would pen lyrics to The Doors albums, Waiting for the Sun, and most of the soft parade, including the song Love Street about the house and the neighborhood. The lyrics, I see you live on Love Street, there's this store where the creatures meet, is a reference to the Canyon Country Store just outside their window. World famous groupie Pamela DeBar has a special memory of the house. We caught up with her on one of her rock and roll tours of Laurel Canyon. I used to stay with a friend of mine who lived right next door up here. And uh, I heard the Doors music being played. And I said, who in the world has, has this pre-release Doors album, you know? So I would tip down the, all these steep stairs and I peeked in the door and it was Jim singing along to the end and it was pretty hot. <laughs> I actually walked into the house and proceeded to do a back bend. So I had just learned how to do a back bend, so I was very, very proud of it. And I looked up and Pam was looking down at me. Oh. <laughs> and she said, get the bleep out of my house. The female attention that he got was like nothing I had ever seen in my life. As much as he wanted to be in the public eye and to be a rock star, he hated it. He, he was trying to, you know, um, to be taken seriously as, as an artist, as a musician, rather than a sex, sex object. And I kept telling him, dude, it's all part of it. And if you didn't look the way you look, more, more than likely they wouldn't listen to you. So it's all part of the package. But he never understood that. He was overwhelmed by all the attention, which I think is what led him to drink more. And that led to legendary fights between Jim and Pam. The neighborhood would all hear it. The people at the Canyon store would see it. What they'd particularly see would be Pam throwing Jim's clothes out the window, his record collection. And if it was a really bad fight, his book collection, which was very important to him. On New Year's weekend of 2012, an arson fire destroyed much of the house, which is currently being rebuilt. But the Love Street house is no stranger to fires, and one in particular is a widely debated subject. Then photographer Bobby Klein was Jim and Pam's neighbor. They were in love. They were in love. It was very tender, and when Jim was straight, it was it was beautiful. The, there's always been this big controversy about this one scene in, in the Oliver Stone film where, where Jim puts Pam in the closet and lights it, lights it on fire, and many people have said it never happened. No, it happened because Pam Pam came to my house right after, and we were one, one house separate from each other. Jim was accusing her of sleeping with some playboy around town, and uh, he was pretty uh, messed up. He got really, really angry, threw her in the closet, lit the closet on fire, and um, it happened. She came to my house afterwards, freaked out. So you actually, so you went down and you actually saw that the that the closet had had been on fire. He, all around the edges, it was all it was all smoke. Yeah, there was a lot of con people said it didn't happen, but it it definitely happened. Sadly, the normally quiet and reserved poet would face many personal demons in his very short life. I could see it was a bit too much. It was a bit uncomfortable because at the very heart and core of who Jim was, he was a truly a gentle soul, a very and very sweet and and also very kind. When I first met him, he was Jimmy James, and we were playing at the California Club, and he was playing with the Isley Brothers. The first day I met him, if he was playing my guitar, I walk in, and there's a strange man playing my axe. So, and that's not something that musicians do to each other, you know, pick up a guy's axe, you know. He uh, said, well, she looked so lonely sitting there, I thought I'd come and introduce myself. And so that was so cute that I laughed, and, and we became friends right then. Jimi Hendrix was very quiet. I, I, people say, what was he like? He was like a little boy. Very shy. Very shy. You'd read it as insecure. Except the moment he stepped onto the stage, it was magic. When we knew him back in the day, he wasn't very good. He was just kind of a journeyman guitar player like so many others were. And then he started adding effects of wah-wah pedal and, and other things that um, were not initially made for guitar. And everybody thought, nobody wants to play that. And, uh, but he saw something different in it and was able to actually utilize the sounds of it. I, I recommend to the producers, because uh, we were looking for an opening act at the time, uh, he was uh, the opening act for our first tour. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was strange. 
strange. I mean, it is. Well, the, nobody knew who he was, and the music, of course, is very different. And when Hendrix hit the stage... We want Davy. We want the monk. Peter, Mickey, Davey. And they were booing and oh, and, and you know, anybody can get hurt by that. And he threw the guitar down and left the stage because he left the tour. Do you remember the moment where you, you heard him and you thought, wow, he's not just a regular guitar player anymore? I came to the whiskey and he was playing there. And um, I didn't know, we didn't know it was the same Jimmy James. This was, you know, Jimi Hendrix, and we didn't know him. That was so Arthur and I went in and said, oh, man, that's the dude from the California club. And he's playing, and he has all of these people that just, you know, rapt attention. And we thought, oh, where the hell did he get this from? You know, I just, you know, he went from here to here in just, you know, a matter of a few months. And, you know, I asked him about it, and he just, man, yeah, which hit it, man. That's, that was his answer. He just practiced. I don't know. You know, the stars lined up for him, and, and he was. She lives on love. She has robes and she has monkeys Lazy diamond studded flunkies She has wisdom and knows what to do
But who 